Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends, enthusiastic pathology tourists. Uh, I thank you all uh, for coming for this highly morbid session uh, on uh, repulsive, sometimes death-dealing infectious disease, tuberculosis, on a sparklingly fine Jaipur morning when you've got more attractive concurrent sessions underway. Um, let me uh, give you a kind of whistle-stop tour on tuberculosis in India to begin with. Uh, there's one Indian dying of tuberculosis every minute. One-fifth of the global burden of tuberculosis is in India. Uh, it's the leading cause of death in people living with HIV. Almost a third of uh, the deaths in HIV disease are attributable to tuberculosis. And it's one of the top five uh, killers of uh, Indian women in their reproductive prime. Now, those may be uh, cold and abstract statistics, but I think it's our mandate today uh, to make you queasily aware of the kind of schadenfreude that exists about tuberculosis uh, in this country. Uh, we tend to believe that the horrors of tuberculosis are so bleak that uh, people like us will not get it. Ipso facto, uh, people not like us uh, will get it. I think the vanity of that illusion has to be broken, has to be shattered. Uh, because, uh, you know, if film stars and celebrities and heads of state can get tuberculosis, so can you. If, if Amitabh Bachchan can get tuberculosis, so can you. It doesn't require um, a vector like a mosquito or a bug. It doesn't require sexual intimacy. Uh, it's airborne. And uh, frankly, uh, if you think that the BCG vaccine that you have in your arm is giving you some kind of protection against infection is not happening. If, if vaccines were modes of transportation, if the measles vaccine was the Lamborghini, uh, the BCG is like a wheelbarrow. Uh, so that's not happening. Um, well, uh, uh, we are here to, um, to celebrate the release of the book, Phantom Plague, How Tuberculosis Shaped History. And uh, this is an absolutely stellar social history of tuberculosis by the award-winning investigative journalist uh, Vidya Krishnan. Uh, Ms. Krishnan charts the arc uh, from 19th century vampire panics in New England to the Warrens of Dharavi. And uh, I'll set into motion by asking Ms. Krishnan, why is tuberculosis the phantom plague? Huh, that's a that's a searching question. Um, is I use that to mean multiple things in the book. Uh, firstly, I when the HIV epidemic happened in the 90s, that's when there was this realization that TB is a really big problem, and uh, TB has somehow been a sidekick to all these sexy new viruses that come from time to time, and we now have that with COVID, and India's entire tuberculosis program has been COVIDized down to the health ministry's helpline. And um, we were talking about it earlier that uh, at these sessions when I talk about the book, uh, so often I have people who come up to me much later and say my, my grandmother had it or my mother had it. And there is so much, uh, there is uh, almost an intimacy when you share someone in your life has TB as against other diseases where there is almost a performance of wanting comfort from outsiders, like, you know, we talk about depression and abortion and cardiac uh, problems, and you tell people you love that comfort me and bring me food or hold my hand as I sit through chemotherapy, whereas you have an entire cohort of patients who've just been invisibilized not just by the people around them, but also by the system. So we have these great myths about 
TB, I say that it's everywhere. There are three myths about TB, that it affects the poor. It affects uh, one organ, which is the lungs. And uh, it's curable. At this point, all three are so dangerously wrong that they feed the cycle of infection that we are in. Um, as you said, uh, no amount of caste or gender or wealth can save you from an airborne respiratory disease, which we now know from COVID. When I was working on this book uh, uh, much, much before the pandemic, uh, most of the people were like, all the questions would be like, w why are you writing about TB? And to me, it was just insane that this is, here is a disease that has shaped our lives. It has inspired art and culture and, you know, operatic tragedies. A uh, few people know that Moulin Rouge was uh, me. TB is, uh, e TB is such a consistent character in all of these great works of literature uh, without ever being the protagonist. And that's, uh, that's what, uh, if anything, I'm for the underdog. So here uh, I wanted to shine the spotlight on how TB has always been the sidekick to some other terrifying thing without ever getting the kind of attention it needs from WHO but also from many other uh, many other social but also political um, points where it kind of needs intersection. And that's actually what I hope my book, uh, it's a conversation I hope my book forces. Well, uh, a lot of these myths come from popular culture. And um, I remember there was a time in India when uh, tuberculosis was the cinematic illness of choice. Uh, so, uh, I mean, in the days when I was growing up or uh, earlier. And uh, I don't know if there were a species called casting directors, but uh, the tubercular part in Indian cinema was snapped up by Nirupa Roy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some of the characters that were scripted for her were such that she had the limitless capacity of losing her children in her afflicted state, you know? It happened in f film after film. And the trouble was that uh, not a lot of people know this, but she was Gujarati. Uh, and uh, this is well-fed, if you'll forgive the mirth, <laughs> and well-built uh, Gujarati women hardly looked physically tubercular. <laughs> so how represented reality suffered in Indian cinema uh, because of Nirupa Roy being the <laughs> tubercular part uh, is, uh, should be a, a legitimate axis of inquiry. But anyway, uh, you mentioned Moulin Rouge. Uh, there's a lot of literature where consumption was considered a fashionable disease uh, in Victorian times. And uh, tell us something about that. Um, I have this joke that I keep talking about that consumption was this romantic malady. And you know, uh, there's a painting, of, uh, Monet painted his wife dying of tuberculosis. And we get, we get this gaunt looking, you know, uh, idea of what beauty is from tuberculosis and uh, you know, uh, it was called the white plague because uh, you get paler and uh, sicker and gaunter like a model for some you know, fashion uh, magazine and all of that comes from tuberculosis. And for me, when I spent my time researching this book, I realized all of this is a matter of uh, relative, relative to other diseases. So the plague of our time says COVID or HIV or tuberculosis, I would argue. But uh, in, in the time when tuberculosis was considered a romantic malady, the other big killer was uh, um, cholera. That's a bad way to go. I mean, you are just shitting yourself to death. And I feel like because when you compare cholera to TB, TB just looked like a romantic malady. And it also had a string of uh, writers and poets and, uh, you know, it, it went after the Bronte sisters, each one of them. Uh, and there were so many, and there was all of this uh, myth building about TB that you were almost intelligent. Uh, you, there, there is this uh, paragraph which I have in the book from, uh, um, from, from I, forget, uh, I forget where I quoted from, but that book says that you are almost purified by the disease because tuberculosis kills it. And that's only because cholera was the other big uh, thing going around. Uh, I do feel that when, after the germ theory was uh, accepted and this idea 
of germs infiltrated the Western imagination before, before it came to India, I feel, uh, as a part of the colonial, you know, the medical uh, mission to expand colonialism. And uh, before all of that changed, tuberculosis was said to be hereditary and run in families. And I find all of that fascinating, which is why when I remember, I still remember sitting in my newsroom at the Hindu and coming across this medical paper uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine about vampire panics. And it was my open sesame for the book because it's, it's just completely mental that there is this disease. And we, as, a, as we are so scared of this pathogen that instead of thinking of the most obvious thing that this is contaminating each one in the family and killing us, we rationalize it by saying that the dead person is crawling out of the grave and sucking on the person they love the most. And there is a vampire panic that's born. And of course, then we have Bram Stoker who comes up with uh, Dracula. And how tuberculosis, it was just, uh, I still remain uh, completely fascinated by how uh, the, the how tuberculosis can capture someone's mind with fear and just inspire so much literature from it. Yeah, I mean, when uh, we were medical students, I came across this um, sentence uh, by one of the Bronte sisters, Charlotte, I think, uh, that uh, consumption is a flattering malady. And it made no sense to people on the subcontinent. I mean, uh, the fact that a disease that causes cadaverous wasting and hacking violent cough and, and incessant diarrhea and constant fever and, and causes you to expectorate blood uh, can be considered fashionable and flattering made no sense. It was absurd. Um, so uh, Vidya has, this is, it, it's not just um, a fantastic work of historical narration, but also reportage, and, and uh, uh, she's been working uh, on these stories uh, for many years now. And uh, the grave thing about tuberculosis, is, as she pointed out, was that the preeminent form is pulmonary. It involves the lungs and it turns your lungs to sludge. But these little wrigglers can get into any organ that you might care to name. It could be the spleen, the liver, the intestines, the uterus, the other pelvic organs, brain, spine, lymph nodes. In fact, uh, as medical students will testify, if you have matted lymph nodes in the neck for long that are not going away, uh, you would almost always uh, have to consider this as tuberculosis. Uh, what's happening is that uh, this bacterium is gaining resistance to the drugs we have at a stupefying rate. And perhaps uh, the epicenter of this is in Mumbai. Uh, so why don't you tell us about some of your work in Mumbai reporting on drug-resistant tuberculosis and some of the stories you encountered there? Um, so I, a lot of, so the first part of the book is mostly pop culture, so there's Sherlock Holmes and Dracula. But the second part is based in Mumbai, which is what uh, South Africa, uh, KwaZulu-Natal and South, South Africa was to the HIV crisis. The only difference is people in South Africa knew they were the epicenter of the crisis. As against in Mumbai, where we have a situation where uh, uh, the, the urban housing crisis in Mumbai has created living conditions which make the city a petri dish uh, for, for uh, pathogens to just thrive and springboard out of it. And COVID, of course, has uh, taught us all of that about how, how that happens when you're, you know, tightly packed in ghettos. What's happening in Mumbai, I, I did a lot of my reporting in uh, Govandi in Chembur, which is Mumbai East. And within Mumbai, uh, Mumbai East is where uh, most of the population lives in these vertical slums, which came up in the 90s as uh, the Indian government's response to uh, better housing, which was a free market solution where they raised uh, all the slum clusters and built vertical slums to 
uh, rehabilitated, but what that did is, these were really tiny houses with no ventilation, no municipal services, no garbage, no, um, uh, no schools, no parks, just, just it's a, a doctor working there, called it Nazi ghetto. And this is happening in every mega city in the world, but it's specifically happening in every mega city in the global south, particularly in India, where we sentence uh, lower caste, poor people, uh, to living conditions which are so subpar. And you were talking about how Amitabh Bachchan had uh, Spinal TV uh, when he was filming the first season of Kaun Banega Karodpati. And there's no escaping it. Uh, our, our lift, uh, our guard, our people, our lift operator, or our cabbie, they all live in these places. And Mumbai is a city inherently built on people mixing. And uh, I was reporting in this particular building in uh, Chembur which had 51 patients in one building. All of them had drug-resistant tuberculosis. And this is, this is, this stop, it would be equal to 51 patients with a rare cancer in one building. And uh, that is par for the course in Mumbai. And as you said, uh, uh, Mumbai is the hottest of hotspots uh, for drug-resistant TB. And uh, this bacteria is just, just a master mutator. It is not responding to the most powerful antibiotics we know. And it also doesn't help that the most powerful antibiotics we know are in patent monopolies. So it's, uh, it's uh, error, piled on error, piled on error. And uh, it's, it's terrifying to see what's happening. But mostly for me, it's terrifying that no one in Mumbai seems to know what this is happening. So the whole year that I was reporting there, um, I was living in Bandra and Kolaba, but I was reporting in these ghettos. And I was there through Diwali and Eid. And a bunch of my friends work in Bollywood, and they are upper caste rich people, upwardly mobile, uh, who travel. And they would come up to me at these parties, uh, you know, on Diwali or Eid, and they would quietly be like, uh, my grandmother had TB or my father still recovering from it. And it always shocks me how little conversation we have as a society because of the stigma that we have built. And that again is a, uh, there's a portion of the book that goes into how caste impacts public health. And uh, tuberculosis more than anything else is about collective destiny. And that's where, you know, we are, we, I keep saying that tuberculosis is a symptom, poverty is a disease, and how we treat urban poor in India is actually the crisis. Until we address that, there is no addressing uh, TB or COVID or HIV, but a bunch of public health uh, nightmares that we are witnessing. All of it, uh, we are seeing... I keep saying none of this is either dramatic or controversial. What we are seeing is a dawn of uh, the post-antibiotic era, and that's what's happening in Mumbai. I think all of, all of us should be concerned and, and alarmed about uh, drug resistance uh, that microbes are picking up. Um, one of uh, your heroes in the book, uh, Dr. Zari Rudvadia, who's, uh, who's a well-known physician in Mumbai, has this uh, popular chestnut on treating tuberculosis. He says that it takes 2.1 errors to convert a drug-sensitive case of tuberculosis into a drug-resistant tuberculosis, just 2.1 errors, which means either giving the wrong drug or giving a wrong combination, or giving a wrong dose. And uh, he, he has this famous paper published on this, where, as we had, we had established that Dharavi in Mumbai is the epicenter, uh, there are about 106 practitioners, private practitioners in Dharavi, medical practitioners. Uh, he gathered them, and he, he gave them a questionnaire about what is the standard prescription you'll write for a 50 kilogram individual uh, f diagnosed for the first time with pulmonary tuberculosis? And out of these 106 practitioners, just six of them were able to prescribe, give out the correct prescription. A hundred of them 
uh, were prescribing the wrong thing. So think about it. And, this, and uh, let me tell you, this is across the board. Don't think uh, that a suited physician in, uh, in a posh clinic is going to do any, anything differently. Uh, you'd be surprised to know that perhaps the strongest antibiotic, not just tuberculosis, the strongest antibiotic that we have in our midst for drug-resistant gram-negative infections in our ICUs is something called colistin. And colistin is given as animal feed to farmed animals for growth promotion. And resultantly, almost 57% of Klebsiella and gram-negative uh, bacilli in India are resistant to the strongest drug we have against colistin. So of course, all of us uh, must be concerned about this. But what's more important is that if you, if you do get infected with tuberculosis, you cannot choose the variant that is infecting you. And, and God forbid if you get the drug-resistant variant, uh, all the controls are with the government. Tell us something about that. Yeah, thank you for that question. With the Indian government, I will start off saying that the tuberculosis treatment uh, invariably is better at a government hospital than it is at a private hospital. Uh, but, pri but then we have a situation where government hospital, Dr. Udwadia says this, that uh, the government hospital treats you for free, but it's the kind of free you cannot afford. So at a government hospital, you are treated without dignity. Uh, you are treated without safety. Uh, at your most vulnerable, you are in front of a doctor who treats you like a disease and not as a person. That's the problem at the government sector. Then comes the private hospital. The private sector, I'm sorry, to say, you, are, you are a part of the private sector. Uh, it's uh, the private doctors. We have an army of private doctors who at this stage are amplifying our tuberculosis crisis because they are incentivized to keep the patient and uh, just squeeze them for their insurance as against referring them. Uh, the book talks about the study that you mentioned and instead of referring them, uh, it was so shocking to me that most doctors in India cannot identify or uh, uh, cannot diagnose a TB patient and what you cannot diagnose, you cannot treat. Um, so they keep uh, treating patients with this cocktail of antibiotics and most of the patients that I have met over the years were drug sensitive before they began and they went through this journey of private sector doctors uh, sending them from here to there to you know your neighborhood mom and pop clinic and over months you're progressively getting worse and before you end at a gov government facility you have drug resistant tb so this is a this is a situation that um, that the government is actively it's, it's really concerning. Uh, it's exactly like COVID, actually, where you need uh, treatment uh, free at the point of care. But what we have in India as a TB policy is that the TB patient bears the burden on top of the stigma of being uh, an infectious disease carrier. It, it falls on you to prove you have to qualify for treatment. And uh, we, have, we have a kind of policy which gives you the best medicine when you're an inch from death, uh, which is uh, if you are drug resistant TB, you have to be pre-XDR to get bedaculin or delaminate. And those drugs are also not available. And then there is a really big, to me, this is a moral crisis. Uh, I've reported a lot over the past three years on COVID. And this, this is what Everything that I was writing about TB over the last seven years came to pass in the three years when I was reporting on COVID. And we had a situation, particularly in India, which had a devastating second wave. Uh, I was in Boston at the time, and again, I joke about how the rest of the world had like a 21st century pandemic. In India, we had a 14th century pandemic with bodies floating uh, in Ganga, and uh, everything from the hospital to the crematorium uh, to, to wood for, you know, we ran out of everything as a society. And this is not, this is not a country which lacks good doctors. This is not like a back of beyond uh, resource. I, of course, we are resource poor in certain places. 
But uh, the second wave was the first time we had like uh, rich upper caste people in Delhi, you know, clutching their pearls and being very horrified about how bad the health system is. But this is what we pay for. This is this is what we've created. Um, this is a system we built. Uh, one taxpayer-funded brick at a time over decades. And uh, I keep talking about how what COVID has done, uh, for the first time I am optimistic, there is a lot more attention on uh, infectious diseases, but there is also a lot more attention on the right to health. It's a business between me and my government, which cannot be outsourced to a private, for-profit entity expecting them to do the right thing. This is a moral crisis at the end of it, and I really hope these conversations, like even last Jaipur uh, Lit Fest, I would not expect a conversation like this or a, a book like this to be showcased at a place like this. And things are changing. Uh, I do, I wonder if you feel optimistic. Uh, no, of course. I mean, uh, but also the infrastructure has changed due to COVID because suddenly one of the, uh, one must realize that one of the ways of diagnosis, tu diagnosing tuberculosis uh, is by uh, a nucleic acid amplification test, which was precisely the kind of platform that was used for diagnosing COVID. So suddenly you had numerous laboratories that were accredited for, with this uh, platform. So it has made a difference, but, but you're right. I think, um, uh, I don't think any national tuberculosis program can run without public money. And uh, it has to be accountable. Why don't we throw this open to the public? Uh, if you can have someone circulating mics. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you, I'll let you. I will let you. <laughs> yes, uh, the gentleman uh, in the jacket, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that was a nice talk, nice discussion. Um, I want to ask, that do people understand how these drug-resistant uh, clones are appearing? I mean, are they tracked in any way, or do they just suddenly appear and you realize that it's too late now? You want to take this one? Sure. So... Um, there are two ways of getting a drug resistance strain. You can either develop resistance by inadequate, incorrect treatment, uh, or you can get infected with a drug resistance strain. Uh, what happens is that, first of all, the, the, the average time between someone manifesting with symptoms of tuberculosis in this country and getting treated is anywhere between two to six months. And there have been studies about this. So, which means this individual is going around spreading uh, infection everywhere. Uh, so it's absolutely essential that there should be continuing medical education sessions across the country, training physicians uh, of all stripes and shades uh, and all denominations about the correct method of treating drug-sensitive tuberculosis, establishing a quick diagnosis, also running uh, Coterminously, drug sensitivity tests, which are now freely available, even, I mean, there are numerous uh, government, Sarkari laboratories now, which are carrying out drug sensitivity tests, so that you know within, some of these assays can be, can let you know in a couple of weeks or under uh, 10 days whether you have resistance to a couple of drugs, so that you can then move on to the appropriate regime. And remember, drug Resistant tuberculosis is only treated at government centers because some of the stockpiles of the drugs are available only with the government. Um, uh, the lady uh, uh, there. Uh, thanks. Just want to ask you about the vaccine. You spoke about the BCG vaccine, which I think is a pretty old vaccine. Um, is there any, recently a newspaper said very little work has been done on the vaccine since it was first created. Because this is a disease of uh, poorer countries and in poorer countries of poorer neighborhoods, which you yourself have said is not true. So can you tell us something about the vaccine? So um, 
about BCG, uh, it's, it's part of the National Immunization Program. Uh, you get it at birth, and it gives you, it gives the infant uh, reasonable protection against severe disease, but it does not prevent against primary infection. Uh, there is some evidence that it can protect you against uh, tubercular meningitis and disseminated forms of the disease, but it doesn't do any more than that. There is work currently underway on, on more effective vaccination against tuberculosis, but I'm afraid I'm not up to speed with the uh, details on that, perhaps. Uh, oh, we have, thankfully, there is a, a, a bunch of uh, tuberculosis, uh, very uh, promising candidates in the pipeline. Uh, the worry I have with those uh, things exactly like COVID vaccinations is they are all uh, tied in uh, some sort of patent monopolies at some point when they do come. My concern with, uh, again, with it's, it's not enough to have a vaccine. Uh, what we need after the vaccine is, and again with TB vaccine, exactly like COVID vaccine, there is a lot of taxpayer funded investments that have gone into it or philanthropic. They're all collaborations between philanthropies and pharmaceutical companies or universities and philanthropic uh, and pharmaceutical companies. But when they come to market, they are in patent monopolies and most people can't afford it. So there are still a couple of hurdles we find, but there are vaccinations and I do hope with COVID, I keep saying that this, that the, the fight for the right to health uh, is the 21st century civil liberties movement. It's not a fad, it's a movement. And I remain hopeful that uh, we will see a vaccination at a mass scale soon. Yeah, there's a cracking line in the book where she says, the toxic kindness of philanthropists, which is, I think, a wonderful and imperishable uh, line. Uh, yes, the gentleman here, please. Thank you. Uh, could I address this question to both of you? Uh, I'm sure you will agree with me that the Tourism Department of India is doing a great job in uh, promoting incredible India. Now, after hearing your lecture, I, I think I'm a bit scared regarding visiting India uh, and which city should you go. I mean, now, of course, uh, Mumbai you mentioned, but where else should you go which is safe? Could you give a ranking by which are the hotspots to avoid? <laughs> I will, I say this, I don't write about Mumbai to stigmatize Mumbai. I would be, it's a city very close to my heart. Uh, I went and spent a lot of time in the ghettos and came out without getting TB. With COVID, what we know, I keep saying this sentence over and over again, and I believe words lose meaning the more you use them. But here we are. This is not an issue of where you or I can be safe. This is an issue of the fact that no one is safe until everyone is. And we, you can go, you, you know, uh, again, Amitabh Bachchan doesn't go uh, to where the plebs go. He still got TB. So this is, uh, um, there are precautions that you have to take, which we are all taking for COVID. Airborne respiratory diseases are not something we can save ourselves from by secluding ourselves in some sort of a privilege of cement made of caste or class. And uh, at the end of it, this is not a question of where we can hide from the scary pathogen. It's a question of do we have the decency to come out and fight for the people, for each other? And that's the only way for us to... I keep saying this is about collective destiny. And that's where, that's where the solutions are. Yes, the lady there, please. <clears throat> Hi, just a quick question about um, just, you know, the thinking uh, uh, behind the government on, uh, you know, an airborne disease, which is clearly there and, you know, sort of simmering in different places. The polio vaccine and that whole polio movement has been astounding. It's actually a model we used while we were working in Maheshwar in central India with during the COVID time. I mean, just the whole educating at every level and Rotarians, I mean, people across India have been involved in the whole fight for polio. Why do you think the government hasn't been proactive with TB at that level? Uh, 
You know, I am not aware. Polio is India's uh, biggest public health success since our independence, and I'm not a big fan of that program. I say this only because we should not have to need Rotarians. Uh, po uh, my father worked with UNICEF. I have spent a lot of time volunteering for Polio Ravivar as a child, and uh, the problem when you when you chase disease by disease by disease, instead of building a one-window system at a district hospital where a patient can come in and get immunized for a bunch of things. Because I remember going to bus stops and railway stations and door-to-door -door immunizations. And what that does is that's an opportunity that you've lost to build a good primary health you know, a good center at a very basic level. But I do want to go back to the previous question about uh, the government uh, is miss, the government is somehow high, you know, not telling tourists. Again, this is, this is the thing with the respiratory diseases. Indians are now uh, asked, I was in Canada recently and I was asked to submit a chest x-ray for visa. Uh, but, but, you know, you can, you can India is uh, very well connected with airports. This is not so, again, COVID has taught that we cannot build clinical, that's a very, that's, that's thinking that comes out of fear that you will build walls and have uh, vaccine passports. And all of that is a very dangerous and slippery slope where only black and brown, lower caste, particularly women, uh, get affected. And if, if those are the solutions we talk about, then uh, what we arrive at is something I, I worry about. Yes, please. In the meanwhile, so, might I just add that uh, I think one of the reasons is that we don't have a vaccine for tuberculosis. So effectively, you're looking at therapeutics. And uh, you're looking at a very tricky customer uh, uh, which mutates but also that we should be uh, setting realistic uh, objectives. We currently have uh, an eradicate tuberculosis by 2025 campaign, and I dare say we're gonna get a, a, a mighty side swipe at the jutting jaw of our national vanity uh, on account of that, uh, because we're nowhere close to that. Yes, please carry on. <clears throat> so just a quick follow up to that, which is, I agree with the one window sort of, you know, at the clinic, at the hospital, but I also think one of the things that's been lost in translation with the whole polio um, approach has been that it's about education. If people are not educated, if you were to come to the village where I work, which is a weaving cluster in central India, most people won't even know what TB is. So it's educating everyone from the bottom up, right? which is part of what the polio campaign was originally. I think you need both, I mean, personally. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Um, yes, the gentleman here. Uh, mm. So my question is more about the history of TB, because from what I gather, it's a fairly ancient disease about nine, ten thousand 10,000 years ago. But it seems like the romanticization of the disease is fairly modern, say, post the Renaissance. So how has that happened through history? Uh, there is a book I will recommend for that. Um, how that has happened essentially is, uh, this is something that fascinates me. TB has moved parallel with capital. So TB, human beings were not built to live. Uh, if you've read Jared Diamond's uh, Guns, Germs and Steel, he talks a lot about how human beings are not evolved to live the way we live right now. Uh, we became an agrarian society, we started settling in tighter and tighter clusters, and then industrialization came. And industrialization was the, was the Philip <laughs> this needed. It's, it was a springboard for TB, and uh, uh, we had like in New York, that portion of the book is based in New York where we had this uh, seven cents housing, which is what the Chols in Mumbai are. And uh, what's essentially happened with globalization is the seven cents housing was just outsourced to the black and brown post-colonial nations. And uh, TB has moved parallelly with capital only because the pathogen, which is like we keep saying is a master mutator, has learned more about the hosts while the hosts 
uh, remain completely biased and uh, anchored by our own biases of caste and class and stigma and greed. Um, and uh, it's uh, to me, this book, this, this pathogen just reveals a lot about us uh, more than it's not it's a book that's inc incidentally about tb but it's essentially about how we are when we are at our basis when we face infectious diseases and we saw with covid we are the worst versions of ourselves because infectious diseases reveal to us that that can be me like that is me shown of my illusions and we act out of fear in the worst way and uh, you should pick up the book. I hope you like it. Uh, can we go to that gentleman at the back who has had his hand up for a while? Thank you. Fascinating discussion. I was wondering, uh, Vidya, what kind of reaction there was to your book from the medical and political establishment. Was it defensive? Was it constructive? Did it change anything? Uh, so the book's been released in the uh, in the U.S. before it was in India, and in the U.S. I mostly uh, in the U.S. and Canada I get uh, rea I, I get audiences that are more uh, doctors, and they are glad that I just told the sto told the story because even for doctors. Uh, I keep saying that you know you can't defeat a good story. You can't you can't run it over with a tank. And uh, that was what I wanted to do with the book. Uh, with the political establishment, I've had uh, from WHO, the old guard which was responsible for uh, WHO's TB policy, which is a spectacular failure. Uh, there are regional problems with the Indian government, but at a global level, there are problems too. And the old guard, which was which was responsible for putting the dots policy in place, the TB policy, they are defensive. Uh, I was at I was at a talk at uh, the Harvard Med School, and they were not very happy with how harsh I was about the health policy. With India. Um, with India, the reception is different in a state that is not ruled by BJP. So I have had uh, health secretaries who bought the book and uh, in bulk and distributed it to its TB program. And I, I hear that what the book does is tell a story about people and not about medicine or pathogen or, you know, jargonized way, which I appreciate. Uh, I would really like for the book to be picked up by someone in UP. And I, the, it's, there, it's just uh, total silence. Um, uh, the young woman there, I think we'll end with her. Uh, yeah. the young, uh, uh, why did people associate TB with vampires? Because, uh, <laughs> thank you for that question. Uh, people thought, uh, this is before the germ theory, which, which in medicine is equal to uh, finding gravity. And uh, before we understood, before there were microscopes, and we knew there were these microorganisms that travel and infect us, uh, we thought that uh, diseases, we didn't understand the concept of infectious diseases. We thought you, like in India, uh, we thought it's karmic. We still think it's karmic. Uh, you have cancer because you have sinned. Um, and in the West, the concept was that it runs in the, it runs in the family. And uh, people act, f just, it's, it's just fantastical thinking. And uh, there was folklore in New England where they thought if they, if they exhume the bodies of their dead relatives and put a brick in their mouth and put them back in a plague pit, they will not come out of it. And uh, we, still, we still find plague pits in, uh, there was one in Italy in as, as recently as 2009, but my book focuses in turn of the 19th century in New England. And um, then in 18, 1892, Bram Stoker, there was this one 
uh, case of uh, this woman being is exhumed, which was particularly ghastly, and it made to local newspapers. And that was the time Bram Stoker was researching the book that would become Dracula. And uh, he took five years to write it. That book came out in 1897. Incidentally, Bram Stoker was very interested in medicine. His father was a doctor. His uh, brother was a doctor. So the book uh, has a lot of medicine in it. So the book uh, uh, talks about Dracula uh, infecting, uh, passing on the disease uh, with a blood infection. He bites you on the neck. And blood infection was a new concept. And of course, Dracula was a literary uh, super hit. And it caught on. And uh, so we associate that with vampire, and this is a Twitter version of the story, which is the first chapter of the book. All right, I'm afraid we're completely out of time, but I think one of the things that plague literature teaches us is how weirdly humans react in these crises. It starts off with fear, superstition, and uh, panic, and then selfishness, uh, uh, which we must somehow prevent. Uh, this is a very powerful book. I urge you all to read it. This is also an urgent plea for an intervention. I thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for thank you. Uh, being such a wonderful audience. I'll be at the author signing booth if you have a copy and want to say hi.